Welcome back to In Other Waters. Before we head back to the bloom, there's a couple samples that I want to get first. I think exactly two we still have to get. Um, the first one is, I think, on this island, uh, just to the right, past to the UI. Um, we couldn't get there before because we didn't have the new propulsion system, but now we do, so let's do it. Current's edge. You used to hear the current fades and strange pillars rise up from the dark, the ocean floor. Ooh, creatures. Silken plant. Is that a new... That's a new creature. These twisted strands are like webs between the pillars. Let's start logging them. These long, pale green strands of plant matter entwine in flat blades, which trail horizontally between the pillars. I saw another creature that was moving. Oh, well, maybe we'll be able to see it from over here. Oh, yeah, there it is. Also another new one, feathery creature. These funny feathery creatures are all around these gardens. Let's start observing their movements. A cleverly camouflaged creature, mainly composed of feathery, frond-like arms, which it waves rhythmically as it moves. Pillar Garden. This pillar is topped with a layer of bright and sunlit life. Looking around, each of the pillars here has the same green-gold peak. Actually, let's get the creature first, in case it moves out of view. It appears that a number of the creature's feathery arms have sharp edges that it uses to prune the pillar garden's flora. Shimmering petals. In the sunlight, these spade-like petals open themselves wide to the light, welcoming it gratefully. Oh, this isn't the this isn't the special sample that we needed. Creature tracks. Patterns of dents in the sand show the paths of feathery creatures that cross from pillar to pillar in slow and purposeful loops. That's the thing we needed. Shed feather. A delicate feather structure found in the pillar gardens. Oops. Silken plant. These silken strands meet in places and become tangled in one another, forming complex webs that are slow to navigate. Feathery creature. I've observed these feathered creatures moving between pillars along the web-like plants that connect them. Pillar crossing. How did these monoliths form? Perhaps they're cores of harder rock, which remained when the rest was eroded away. Miniature garden. Sample candidate. Some of these pillar tops are very small, but that doesn't seem to stop the petals colonizing them with their bright shapes. Oh, it's just the bright pollen. Silken plant. These trailing plants can be of great length and appear to only grow from the sides of the pillars. How did they form?
Observing the underside of these plants, I can see a layer of pores. Stomata, perhaps, for waste release. feathery creature. It seems that if they're knocked off a surface, these creatures can swim, but very inefficiently. Must be an emergency measure. Ooh, I want to get this creature. It's apparent that matter from the blooms, such as pollen, collects in this creature's feathery arms. Is this intentional? Twisted tendrils. The individual thin fibrous strands which make up these pillar bridges are so fine they could almost be silk. Oh, what is this? Silken strands. Pale green strands of plant tendril from the pillar gardens. Tendril maze. It's easy to get confused once you're among these web tendrils, navigating between sunken islands of life. I've observed these plants in shades which stretch from bright green to ivory white. Is this an indicator of their age or health? Empty pillar. The tendrils seem to be avoiding this pillar. In fact, they appear to be avoiding the main shelf of the reef altogether. I've noticed these strands don't connect directly to the pillars, but disappear into holes in their sides. What are they connected to then? Long tendril. This tendril has to stretch a long distance to bridge these pillars. How do they grow like this, without any support? There we go, added it to the taxonomy. I've named these sea silk, though I'm not sure what kind of plant it is. Check my notes back at base. Long strands of pale green and white plant matter that twist into broad, flat bridges and webs between the pillar gardens. Pillar garden? This pillar top is a little sparser than some of the others. Perhaps these more southern pillars have only been recently seeded? We don't really need more bright pollen. In fact, we're full. Long tendril. Down here, only a single bridge leads from pillar to pillar, a lone creature braving the currents as it crosses. Out, away from the other gardens, this wide pillar feels like a calming sanctuary, a blob of green and gold in a sea of blue. More bright pollen. Another species. I'm calling these gardeners. They're so attentive and purposeful. I want to know more about them. A feathery, slow-moving creature that prunes the plants of the pillar gardens, moving between pillars along their silken bridges. Last tendril. One final bridge stretches down to the southernmost pillar, its strands swaying with the rising current. Despite being so thick, this pillar is cut through with small holes, and on its top a couple of shell plates catch the light. Uh. 
Ooh, this is something new. Uh, let's release some things. We don't really need bright pollen at all. I wonder if the creatures would react to it at all. Chitin plate. A shard of chitin plate left behind by a segmented worm. Germinating garden. These small young petals are starting to open up to the three sons of Gliesi 667cc. This place will be even more beautiful one day. Another new thing! Okay, well, more bright pollen. Don't need it at all. Petal shoot. A new shoot of a petal plant from the pillar gardens. tendril. A tendril loosely dangles from the pillar, its root half pulled out of the rock. It's pale and bulbous. We could sample it here. Another new thing, my god! Okay, I don't need the... Actually, wait, what is this? Shed feather, we're absolutely keeping that. Yeah, that's new, that's new, this is new, so I guess I'll just get rid of the shrill sacks. Silken root. A spherical translucent ball. Is this a root? We've already sampled here, right? Just bright pollen. Lone pillar. Despite sitting all the way out here, this pillar is hooked up to the others by a long tendril. That's new also. These creatures are tricky to catch a glimpse of. Let's see if we can scare up a few more. Burrowing creature. When disturbed, this segmented creature shot out of its burrow, ejecting grit and sediment as it swam away. Quite the surprise. Feathery pinnule. A creature has left behind one of its delicate arms here. Perhaps in order to escape from a predator? We could take a sample of it. Another new thing. Oh, I scared it. What do we dump? I mean, I guess we don't need two of anything, technically. These are worth a lot of power, so in terms of usefulness, that's pretty useful. The silken strands don't do much, so I'm comfortable getting rid of one. Feathery arm. A feather arm clogged with pollen from the pillar gardens. Small burrow. Too small to enter, this hole in the pillar leads deep into the rock. A tailpiece left by the inhabitants sits just inside. We could sample it. <laughs> Another new thing. Oh, I scared it away, but I didn't sample it. I didn't scan it soon enough. The bright kite.
chitinous shards of a tail shell shed or severed. I wonder if it would come back if I moved away a bit. Or maybe it moved to another location? Like maybe it moved... Oh, I think it did move over here. Yes. These creatures scrape away at the pillar's surface, carving their burrows into the rock. It's impressive given the density of the pillars. They carve their burrows into the rock. Does that mean they make the holes that the silk strands string between the rocks with? Crossing strands. Where these tendrils meet, the feathery creatures are able to carefully clamber from one to another, leaving behind feathers as they do. Another sample candidate. Is this stuff I already have? Yes. Thank God. <laughs> Tangled tendrils. These tendrils have grown close enough to each other to form a complex tangle of strands between the small pillars. Crossing creatures. The feathery creatures that pass, pass along the tendrils seem to be unshakable in their routines, each one carefully doing its rounds. Thin pillar. This impossibly thin pillar rises up from the murk like a pencil, its sides marked by the faint strata of geological eons. wide gap. The gaps between the pillars are a pattern I cannot read, one that speaks of a complex geological history. Twisted tendrils. The gaps between the tendrils are webbed with fine strands, almost invisible to the naked eye. Already got those. Oh, creature. I've observed these creatures have a bright tail lure made from many thin pointed plates. What is its purpose, I wonder? Enclosed water. This patch of water is entirely enclosed by webbed tendrils, and thin strands float through the water like lost hairs. Tendril holes. These two tendril bridges almost meet before disappearing into holes in the pillar. Are they rooted to the rock inside? Large pillar. This broad pillar is full of rough looking boreholes. Chitin plates, glinting here and there, suggest their burrows. Oh no, new one! No, not that. Pillar worm. I'll name these pillar worms. They seem to have burrows all over this place. These long segmented creatures with distinctive bright tails burrow into the hard rock of the pillars to protect themselves. Hold pillar. Oh wait, um, there's sampling available here? Ah, chitin plates, but we already got those. Hold pillar. The lower parts of this pillar are marked with narrow holes. Around them, small plates of chitin shells glint. Yep, already got those. Twisted tendrils. 
What dictates, what dictates which pillars the tendrils stretch to and from? I'm yet to see a tendril which is only halfway formed. Pillar Garden. This pillar top is thick with waving petals, each one caked in tiny particles of golden pollen. Open Water. The green tendrils don't seem to reach east beyond this point, preferring instead to turn back into the protected water south of here. Blue haze. Out away from the pillars, the ocean grants a sense of vertigo, fading down to unknown depths below. Barren pillar. This pillar, unlike the others, lacks a garden of its own. Have the plants been cleared, or have they simply not reached this far yet? Vast shape. The light of the system's three suns falls onto something amber and huge to the east. It's almost like a pale orange cloud. What is that? Shifting tentacle. This translucent tentacle doesn't have a fixed shape. Its individual parts instead cycle through developmental phases as they cohere. What? Cycle through developmental phases as they cohere. What is this? Floating colony. Oh, that's a new creature. This creature is impossibly large. I don't even know how to start logging data on it, but I'll try. These golden yellow streams of life shift around solid objects held suspended in the water. Are these bones, rocks, or something else? Pulsing Barrier This hard barrier is webbed with pulsing nodes. To gain access, we would need to slice through it somehow. What are we looking at here? This appears to be a huge colonial life form. There are passages inside. But unless we can cut this barrier, we can't reach them. Okay, so we need to come back here when we have a new tool or something like that. Floating colony. This golden colony is overwhelming. Where to even begin? Thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of... Zooids make up its shifting interior. It seems that the zooids are split into specialized functions and forms, from jellyfish-like metusoids to balloon-like bladders of gas. Still waters. The green tendrils that enclose this space seem to calm the currents, creating a pool of still water. Twisted tendrils. These entwined tendrils are flat like blades of kelp and hold themselves taut between the pillar tops. Green webs. Between the pillars, bright green webs of 
twisted tendrils extend, forming thin pathways, thin pathways from garden to garden. Okay, I think that's all. Check a little bit more over here. Yeah, I think that's all. That was a lot. I was expecting to go here and get a sample and come back. But it turns out there's three new creatures that we've never encountered before over here. Let's call for a pickup. Oh, that's not a pickup. That's charging our oxygen propulsion system. All of this is new stuff. Literally all of it. I was about to say, it still shows that we need the sample over here, but I think that's just because we haven't actually scanned it. We have the sample, but haven't processed it. We just did so much science. The gardener. Oh, we did everything for the gardener. Okay. Observations. Gardeners are feathery, slow-moving creatures that live among the pillar garden flora. Their upper part is mainly composed of densely packed, fern-like arms. Underneath is a body resting on a dense profusion of short, root-like legs that anchor the gardener, but also enable it to walk, albeit very slowly. As gardeners move, they also rhythmically wave their arms, though it's unclear if this is for balance or as part of their pruning action within the petal gardens they inhabit. Gardeners don't do anything fast, but they do travel between pillars using the silken tendrils that grow between them. More analysis is needed to discern why and what their relationship to these gardens really is. Behavior Analysis of a gardener's feather, which I have called a pinule, has revealed that gardeners feed on the same thing they camouflage themselves as, the garden's petals. The gardener feather pinules have a razor-like edge with which the gardener cuts away thin sections of petal to feed on, without damaging the plant. However, unlike an actual feather, they contain nerves, suggesting the crawler can deliberately control them for precise pruning and for maneuvering in the water if they become dislodged from a tendril bridge. Quite why they risk such journeys given their ineffective swimming remains to be seen. Further study may unlock the puzzle of their purpose within the biome. Theory Analysis of a gardener's arm filled with pinules has shed some light on the relationship between them and the pillar gardens. The debris coating the sample is actually pollen from various garden species, suggesting that gardeners are an important part of the cross-pollination process. This means their contribution to the ecosystem is not just limited to pruning the blooms, they help propagate them too. Indeed, given their roaming paths from pillar to pillar, they must have some way of communicating and ensuring that no one garden becomes wilted or overgrown. This could be an use social hive structure or a territorial signature they leave behind. 
Either way, they're a well-coordinated team of marine landscape gardeners. That is so cool! Yeah, at first glance, they kind of just look like a underwater plant. Just kind of a little bushy thing, but then at the bottom, they have limbs and eyes. Ah, got the full thing for the pillar worms. Observations. Pillar worms are long, thin, segmented creatures that live deep in the dark tunnels and recesses of the rock pillars found in the East Reef. They're frustratingly difficult to observe properly, due both to their shyness and their surprisingly rapid swimming speed. They can, however, be startled out of their burrows by consistent tapping on the rock. Once glimpsed, it's evident they have striations that taper to a bright, lure-like tail. Their front half is protected with overlapping, rigid plates. They also seem to be burrowing or, or excavating creatures, ejecting dust and sediment periodically from their burrows. Further analysis is required to determine why they live so reclusively within the pillars. Behavior Analysis of a pillar worm's chitinous plate shows a creature heavily adapted to its burrowing lifestyle. It seems that the chitinous plates found around the organism's head are precisely grooved, allowing the worm to chip away at existing recesses to create tunnels and funneling the sediment back towards the entrance. These grooves should also help protect the creature's head from abrasions while traversing the burrows. It's logical then that these bugs create the tunnels that other life, especially the silken tendrils and the petal gardens, require. They must be one of the foundations of this unique ecosystem, turning the hard rock pillars into vertical gardens through their obsessive burrowing. Theory Dissection of a pillar worm's tail has shed light on their hunting and feeding behaviors. The tail itself is made from many panels of bright translucent chitin. Given the tail's brightness and the way it waves in a current, it's reasonable to conclude that the worm is using it as a lure. It could be an effective tool for the worm to attract small grazers to the tunnel's mouth with, before pouncing from the burrow and pulling its prey into the hole with it. However, the tail might serve another function too, as a countermeasure against predators. Was this specimen bitten off or willingly ejected? Either way, the pillar worms remains the pillar worm remains good at hiding its secrets within those dark burrows. Ah, it's got little swimming fans all along its segmented body. That's how it's able to move so fast. Shimmer blooms. Now we have a theory and a sketch. Analysis of a shimmer bloom shoot has revealed a coiled stalk which each shimmer bloom possesses, allowing them to control their height in the water. This means that if a shimmer bloom grows beyond the optimum depth for photosynthesis, it's able to extend its stalk and rise in the water towards the surface. However, due to the constant sunlight, which is an effect of Gliese 667cc's tidally locked orbit, shimmer blooms also use this ability to retract themselves away from the sun in order to protect themselves from cell damage. These beautiful plants are highly attuned to their environment, and I can think of no better species to give Manet's name to. It is a name that deserves to live on in this place. I'm sorry I can't do more. Oh yeah, give Manet's name to. I just looked at the scientific name. Sol... Sol... Coltor Manet. Beautiful plants. Beautiful just like Manet. Sea silk got everything for it. Observations. 
This bright green plant stretches its silken tendrils in long, horizontal swaths between pillars in the East Reef. This plant is characterized by its fibrous, fine, and flexible strands that can be as thick as rope and as thin as human hair, appearing almost white in sunlight. How they form their bridges and why the plant's tendrils do not rise to the surface is unclear. I've observed one plant intertwined with strands from other pillars, and when these multiple strands meet, often in areas roughly equidistant from their respective pillars, they seem to form a web. I wonder if strands from individual plants are drawn to one another. Behavior Analysis of a strand of sea silk has shown that it is in fact from two different plants that have somehow conjoined where they met. Moreover, there are younger growths formed near to the end of each plant's strand, demonstrating their ability to form new shoots along their length, which must be why I've observed a web-like pattern in some of the tangles. However, new growths require a good deal of energy. The strands are green on one side, a sign of photosynthesis no doubt, but their underside is distinctly darker and more porous looking. Are the strands able to absorb matter floating up from underneath them? I need to analyze the root structure or similar to find out more. Theory I was surprised to discover that the sea silk does not end in roots. After finding a damaged strand, I found it emanating from a kind of silken ball that I initially took to be a root. However, in lab analysis, it was revealed to be an entirely separate creature. The sea silk is a product or plant-like limb of this organism. I discovered the root itself to be able to put down, but also retract, strands of sea silk from within. It's an unusual fusion of creatures. Is this a symbiotic relation or a parasitic one? Regardless, these curious creatures and their growths are the bridge builders of the pillar ecosystem, turning isolated gardens into a connected network and helping them flourish. Yeah, there's the root creature, the ball that sends its strange arms out. That was so cool. I was not expecting going over there to be as big as it was. That was so cool. Okay, so now we have this sample. I wonder if this one's going to be as big as the uh, pillar gardens over here. <laughs> Probably not, but we'll see. I'm also not exactly sure how to get there. Um, I think... Eh. It's hard to tell, but I think this might be around the area where we crossed over to uh, first get to the East Reef Way Station, back when we didn't have the propulsion system to deal with the strong currents. That might be inside of there, or I might have to go back to the beginning and go up through the strong currents that we never were able to defeat. Okay, this spot back here, I know I was never able to go to. Yeah, the currents were too strong, but now we should be able to do it. This is back right around the beginning. Yes. Deep rift. The central rift is deep and wide, and the current running down it is relentless. Rushing waters. Spores and other particles leave greasy streaks on the faceplate of my helmet as they hammer into it. Violent currents. The suit creaks as I lean into the flow, and the unbroken walls ahead suggest nothing worth, worth risking my life for. Oh, I think there's something worth risking our life for. Broken cap, I think that, that must be it. This mushroom-shaped stalk cowers beside the rift. Its cap is broken and segments of it sit in the sand. We could sample one here. There they are. Cap section. Get out of here. A 
analysis of reef cap tissue shows that the reef caps maintain a bacterial symbiont within a series of internal chambers, which, while unique to Gliese 667cc, resembles Epilopischium, something like that, a large-celled bacteria found in the stomachs of terrestrial surgeon fish. Epilopischium helps surgeon fish break down algae effectively, and the reef caps bacteria seem to do the same, with traces of an algae-like growth found with the cap chambers. Where is this algae coming from? However the caps receive it, this algae is allowing the caps to grow bacterial colonies, which then reduce themselves to endospores when the algae is digested. These endospores are then released to the stalks in the local area to renew the strength of their colonies. It's an incredible recycling system for protecting this ecosystem. So our next goal is to go down here, which is where the remote lab should be. So let's continue going through the bloom.